Today we're continuing our series of messages on right answers to the wrong questions. And today's wrong question is, why can't we complain? The text for our thoughts is found in the Hebrew book of Numbers, the 21st chapter, verses 4 through 9. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, the children of Israel set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who's bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have been told on more than one occasion that I cannot tell a joke. Nevertheless, one of my favorites is about a little boy, perhaps four or five years old, who in his entire life had not uttered a word. Obviously, this was of great concern to his parents, but then one day at the breakfast table, the little boy suddenly blurted out, the oatmeal's cold. His mother was shocked by this and said, you've never spoken a word, why now? To which he responded, well, up until now, everything has been fine. I wonder if our own speech were limited to complaints, how much you and I would have to say. Some of my favorite people would be rendered virtually mute because they almost never say anything by way of complaint. On the other hand, there are some people who we would not be able to tell any difference about because it seems that every word that comes out of their mouths is a complaint. I would suspect that most of us lie somewhere in between not complain all the time, but certainly more than we should, and it does damage to us, just like it did to the children of Israel. And so I think this text applies to those of us in that latter category most of all. The story from the book of Numbers today is the last in a series of stories that some commentators call the murmuring stories. Murmuring is one of those onomatopoeic words that sounds like what it means. A poet might say that a brook murmurs. It's what happens when the water ripples over the rocks, and it's a pretty good description of what happens with complaints. One person may say something, not necessarily very loud, but it becomes kind of a background noise, and someone else picks it up, maybe someone who hadn't even noticed the problem before, but then they can complain about it too, and then that goes on and spreads until it's just like murmuring in the background that's always there. There's always a complaint that causes problems for everyone. As I say, this is the final in a series of murmuring stories where the Israelites were complaining seemingly about everything. Moses had led them out of captivity in Egypt into a place that was called Merah, and there they were thirsty, but they complained because the water tasted too bitter. So Moses led them on from there, and after a while they weren't satisfied with the food that they had, and so they complained about that, and God provided manna for them to eat. Another time, shortly after that, they became thirsty and there was no water to be found around, so God commanded Moses to strike a rock and the water came gushing out. After they had left Sinai and were continuing through the desert, they got hungry again and this time they complained and God caused a wind to come and bring quail for them to eat. But there was a plague about the same time and the people seemed to be far more concerned about how sick they were than with the fact that God had given them something to eat. Finally, they reach what God has led them toward all along, the promised land. They are supposed to go on into the land of Canaan, but they send spies there, and then they complain because they say the people are too big, the battles will be too dangerous, the struggle will be too hard. And at that point, God says, fine. Then those of you, of you who complained will not enter into the promised land, but only Joshua and Caleb, not even Moses, and the children who were not old enough to know exactly what was going on. It seemed to be one story after another of complaint and then God providing for them. There are two ways for us to look at those kinds of stories. One is that the people recognized they had problems. They complained to God and God answered their 
uh, concerns. The other way, the way I think is more proper to look at it, is that God was always watching over them. God was protecting them, and their com complaints were simply distractions, needless distractions from what God was going to do anyway. Sometimes we're complaining totally unnecessarily. I had a friend who was in charge of his United Methodist Church's men's fish fry. This friend of mine, now deceased, was a great promoter. He could promote just about anything, and unfortunately, in this case, he sort of over-promoted the fish fry, and far more men showed up than they had originally planned for. And when he saw the, the line of men who were still waiting to be fed, and he looked at the amount of fish and rolls that were left over at that point, he took one of the fish and one of the rolls, and he went to his pastor, and he handed them to him. He said, now here, do your job. I have a feeling that my friend was just joking, but it is a pretty good metaphor for what most of us do so much of the time. We just complain, saying to God, listen, this is the problem we've had. Now you fix it for us. But our story today is a cautionary tale about that sort of thing, just expecting that God is going to do exactly what we want him to do. Up until this point, the people had complained mainly about their leaders, Moses and Aaron. They had said that they were the ones who were causing them problems, but now they have crossed the line. They admit, not at first, but after they began to suffer, that they weren't just complaining against Moses and Aaron. They were actually complaining against God. I don't know what or why this was the final straw, but apparently they pushed God too far. They had moved from complaint to faithlessness. You see, faith isn't some belief about God. Faith is a trust in God. It is an understanding that God is going to take care of you. And in this case, when they don't seem to understand that anymore, when they've lost their trust, God says to them, then you are on your own. And he sends a plague of fiery serpents to come and bite the Israelites. And when they are bitten, they die. It is a hard lesson for them to learn but it is a reminder that when we're out there on our own, we can't call on God to do exactly what we expect God to do for us. Complaining does us no good at all. Before we talk about how God got them out of their mess and how we can avoid them on our own, we might look at some of the reasons that we ourselves tend to complain. And one of them is certainly that we seem to have this sense of entitlement, especially as Christians, because we're like the children of Israel through no merit of their own, not because they were powerful or astute or virtuous in any way. God chose the children of Israel for God's own. And because of that, they tended to think that they were special and that God could do things for them that God would not do for other people. How often do we get like that, this sense of entitlement? Don't our prayers often reflect that? We may come with a false sense of humility and call our prayers petitions, but what we're really doing is demanding that God treat us differently than the way God treats other people, because after all, we deserve it. I was uh, once given a framed cartoon of the, or a comic strip, I guess, of the uh, Hagar the Horrible. And in it, Hagar is in his uh, tiny Viking boat. His boat is almost swamped by the wind and the storm, and he looks up at heaven and yells out, why me? To which the answer immediately comes, why not? I think that's the way it is for all of us. In our tiny human brains, we begin to do the math. We calculate all those things that we have done for God, all the good things we've done with our lives, selectively choosing those things that put us in the best light. Then we subtract from those all the bad things that we have done, conveniently lift it, leaving out anything that probably God wanted us to do that we just fail to do, the sins of omission. And then foolishly in our own minds, we believe that we deserve God's favor on our lives. When the reality is that if you add it all up, none of us deserve the care and protection that God is willing to give as a free gift to anyone who will come and ask for it. The other reason I think we complain is because we look at others' lives and they seem to be better than we are, uh, better off than we are. Of course, we can't really look in their lives and see what they're really like. We make the assumption that they must be doing fine because that's the way it looks on the outside. There's an old story about a woman who was grieving terribly over the loss of her child. She was very bitter about it. She looked around and saw others who seemed to enjoy their children and she didn't have hers anymore. 
And so she went to the village elders to complain about that. And the high priest told, gave her a spoon. And he told her to go around the village and collect a grain of rice from every home where someone had not suffered grief or loss. She went around to every home in the village and, of course, found very few grains of rice to bring back because virtually everyone somewhere in their lives had experienced terrible grief or loss. That was true then. It is true now that all of us from time, one time or another suffer, and so we can't complain because ours seem to be worse than someone else's. Our wrong question for the day is, why can't we complain? And the correct answer to that is, because we really have nothing to complain about. We do not deserve God's favor more than anyone else does. We do not suffer more than many other people suffer. And therefore, because God has given us the gift of God's presence and protection to see us through whatever situations we find ourselves in, we have no reason for complaint. And yet, we do so anyway. In 1992, Robert Hughes wrote a book called The Culture of Complaint, The Fraying of America. He was an Australian TV producer and writer, but he came to the United States and observed that we had gotten into a culture where everyone complained about everything. And because none, no one would take responsibility, always wanted to lay it off on someone else, then the very fabric of the United States was fraying. I read that book shortly after the beginning of the 21st century, uh, in about seven years or so after it was written. And I uh, thought then that it, it really did describe well what I was noticing in society. But I think if I read it now, almost two decades later, I would probably think it's even more true of us today that we have found ourselves in this culture of complaint where no one accepts responsibility for their actions. We all want to blame everything on someone else. And we are fraying at the seams. If this is true for American culture in general, I think it is even more true for those of us who are in the Christian church. Think about it. Whenever you see some Christian leader in the news today, it seems that he or she is simply complaining about all the problems in society or how we as Christians are not being treated fairly. If our mission in life is to be evangelistic, that is to bring others into relationship with God through Christ, if we're to be instrumental in that, and the question we ought to ask ourselves is, well, who would want to join a bunch of complainers? We need to stop this. One of my favorite comedians, Danny Thomas, who, by the way, could tell a joke, once said that he went to the doctor and he said, Doctor, when I raise my arm like this, it hurts. The doctor said, well, then don't do that. That's my basic answer for our complaints. Stop it. We don't need to be doing that. But I know enough about human nature to say simply to tell someone to stop it is not going to be enough. We need some reason for it. And in this, as in all things, God provides the answer to the problems that we have. The people of Israel finally came to the point where they recognized they had made a terrible mess out of things. They had complained to the point where now they were beset by snakes that were biting them and people were dying. They need a way out, and so they called to the Lord. And so God provided a very graphic, very specific way that they could find remedy to their situation. He told Moses to construct a bronze serpent and to hold it up, and whenever anyone looked at that bronze serpent, they would be healed. God provided the way. He was not telling them to worship the serpent. He was simply providing them with a way that when they looked at it, it would remind them that God was the one who would get them out of every situation. Whenever you and I have this tendency to complain, we might step, take a step back and realize that our complaint is a result of our faithlessness. And if we will simply trust God with our lives, then the complaints go away. That was the lesson that the Israelites learned, but they made a mess even of that. After a while, most of the people had either died or been cured, and so they packed the bronze serpent away. But they carried it with them into the promised land. And 500 years later, when Hezekiah, the new king, was trying to institute reforms of worship within the temple, he found that some people were in there worshiping the serpent. And he had to bust it into pieces in order to remind them that they were not to worship any idol, but only to worship God. I don't think I have to go over again the number of idols that we have in our lives, anything that we trust other than God, any idol that we bow before, before in our lives becomes our idolatrous God. 
we are entering or going through right now the period of Lent, a time of reflection, a time of recommitment and confession of our sins. And this is a time to confess to the sin of complaint. This passage from Numbers reminds us of that, but we would probably never even look at that passage were it not tied to another passage for this day. The story of Jesus and Nicodemus, where Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that all who come to Him might be saved. There's your answer. That's the one we look to. We do not complain because we have a source to which we can look, Christ who at that point when he said that, not everyone understood that he was talking about his crucifixion, but he was, something that he experienced, though he did not deserve it, through which we, though we do not deserve his help, are able to come, to be saved, and to have help in whatever situation we find ourselves. When we recognize that, we really have nothing to complain about. Let us pray. Well, God, you have provided the way for faith, for salvation, for facing whatever challenge might come our way. It is through our looking up at Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Forgive us of our sense of entitlement, our feeling that others may have it better than we do, and above all else, our complaints. Help us not to cross that line into faithlessness. Instead, may we be reminded of your ever faithful care over us. And in that, may we always trust through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.